He doesn't like Obama. He didn't like McCain. He doesn't like Rush Limbaugh. Um, what would you describe his politics as? How, how would you boil it down? Hates everything? Or? Well, no, no. He's a, uh, you know, he calls himself a genuine independent conservative. And, mm -hmm. you know, borders, language, and culture is one of his rallying cries. And mm -hmm. so he's, he believes strongly that illegal immigration is hurting America in all sorts of ways. Right. He's, he actually, he worked in a, uh, in a clinic that served gay men in San Francisco in the early mid 1980s, just as the AIDS epidemic was hitting. And, uh, as he tells it, he called for closing down the bathhouses, which got him sort of uh, exiled from this community that he had sort of been part of. Well, liberals who called for that, too, were also really attacked. And yeah, mm -hmm. and so he kind of traces his disillusionment with the gay rights movement to that mm -hmm. moment. So he's a very vociferous critic of the gay rights movement. Mm -hmm. He's uh, said a lot of things about, about terrorism, about Muslim terrorism, and about Islam itself mm -hmm. that have uh, caused a lot of offense to Muslim groups. So right. those are issues that he takes, you know, a position that could be described as kind of an amped up version of the conservative gospel. So I, I can't imagine Glenn Beck 20 years ago volunteering in a AIDS hospice or something like that. Well, How do you get from being, do, you know, working with people with AIDS to being a conservative talk show host? What is his sort of career path? That's so interesting. There's been, you know, a lot of articles that have run about him do, do almost like an expose. Like right. He had this path that he was hiding. Actually, in a lot of ways, he's really proud of his past. He, you know, uh, went to Queens College, then he moved out west. He, he befriended Ginsburg and Ferlinghetti and a bunch of beatniks. He lived in Hawaii. Uh, hmm. he did botanical research in Fiji and eventually got a, a PhD from UC Berkeley, which is funny enough. Wow. And yeah, he was, he was an herbalist and he wrote a whole string of books about natural healing, but he got disillusioned by a couple of things. One of them w was, you know, w was AIDS and his disillusionment right. with the gay rights world. Uh, another was that he says that affirmative action stymied his academic career and he couldn't mm -hmm. get a tenure track job because he was a white male. The conservatives of today, like me, those who believe in individual liberty are actually a continuum of the liberal movement of the 1960s. Only we didn't go off the rail and become Marxists. So, and, and there's this, it's partly social, I get the feeling too. I get the feeling that it's partially living in the Bay Area. Living among the beats, living in North Beach, he kind of came to feel that he wasn't part of this world or that he didn't want to be part right. of this world and that it was partly a personal reaction to what he saw around him. You know, it's, it's funny because when you talk about his life, I think of someone like Norman Pitharitz or Irving mm -hmm. Crystal mm -hmm. who had this sort of... Or David Horowitz. Or David Horowitz. Right. And so that he, he seems to follow the path of quite a few neoconservatives. Right. In the crudest possible term, I think one of the big differences with Michael Savage is that he stayed weird. <laughs> and, and there's a countercultural feeling to his radio show, even now. He was raised Jewish in New York. How important is his Jewish upbringing in his current, I mean, you hear it in his voice. You hear it in his voice. He's kept that, the, the cultural Jewish identity he's mm -hmm. kept very strongly. But spiritually, he talks about himself in a complicated way, kind of as a strong believer in the Bible mm -hmm. and in Judeo-Christian values mm -hmm. and sort of in God, but not necessarily in a straightforward way. Let's say there's reincarnation. I'm trying to use logic here. I know it doesn't work, though. I've tried it a thousand times. So there's nothing left but alcohol at that point. Uh, let's say there's reincarnation. What's, good, what's the good of it if you don't know it? Part of his kind of countercultural identity and an interesting hangover from his days as a beat and his time on North Beach that he's still a lot of the, you know, these, these ideas of reincarnation and these Buddhist ideas are still something that he's fascinated by and often kind of teases them out and kind of wrestles with them on the air, which is, mm -hmm. you know, yet another thing that makes him different from your average political pundit. He also, you write in your piece, he also is sort of obsessed with his own health. Uh, and why is he so worried Incredibly, about that? I mean, he talks about death, I would say, a few times an hour, you know, for right. two or three hours a day, every day. He has an incredibly morbid sensibility, and in a way that is, there's an interesting tension between that and his political beliefs. Mm -hmm. Because part of him wants to say, you know, America's going down the tubes right. because of Obama, because of, you know, Sotomayor and whoever else, and we've got to put a stop to this and save our country. And there's part of him that says, I'm going to die, we're all going to die, it doesn't matter, we're all doomed. <laughs> and, and part of the fun of listening to his show is hearing, hearing those two impulses fight it out. That's why we're focused on politics, to make believe that we don't care about the eternal questions.
This way we can get mad at the Republicans or, or Nixon. You can say Nixon did it. Or you can hate the Democrats that they did it. You don't have to face your own problem. <laughs> you understand this? Or what? Oh, you want to talk about everything? You know, I, I, uh, I'm going to talk about the economy again. What, who do you think I am? Sean Hannity? So when this piece comes out, who do you think you're going to get a harder time from? <laughs> the Savage fans or the people who assume you're going to do a hit job on him and, and are like, wait, you're actually kind of a fan also. <laughs> <laughs> you're liberal friends. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't want to presuppose anyone's reaction to this, but I'll, uh, I'll certainly be listening to Michael Savage uh, this week to see what he has to say. All right. Well, Kay, thank you so much. Thank you. The fusion of entertainment and enlightenment. I'm Glenn Beck, weekdays, noon to 3, on Talk 910 KNEW. We are playing a little Cannibal Adderley on the Savage Nation, only because we're playing Cannibal Adderley on the Savage Nation. Thus far today, we've read excerpts from, listened to podcasts from the article coming out about Michael Savage in the New Yorker, August 3rd edition. It's a major league profile. I'm happy to report you will not see a profile of Limbaugh ever. You'll never see a profile of Hannity ever. You'll never see a profile of Glenn Beck ever. I can guarantee you. Not because they're bad guys. It's just that they're boring and predictable. And I'm not. And so I'm glad to tell you that um, <clears throat> this guy got it, and this is going to be the shooting script in a way for my for my movie. Uh, I've been waiting two years now to decide how to do this movie. I think I'm going to use a lot of what's in this article for the movie of my life. And I think the one person I want to do it is Martin Scorsese. Oh, yeah, he's lining up for it. But, you know, I th it, it, laugh at me, if you will, but I'm going to tell you something right now. Everyone is in flux in the world in the world of politics and art, and people looking for direction. They know the country's in flux, and they don't know what tomorrow is going to bring to this country. And I believe that you're going to see things happen in the arts and in literature and in politics that are unexpected. And therefore, it's not so unusual to believe that I, Michael Savage, so-called independent conservative, could wind up having a movie in my life produ uh, directed by a top director who's known, let's say, for, well, not for politics. I mean, if Stanley Kubrick were alive, I would like Stanley Kubrick to do my movie. Because there's enough oddness in me, and there's enough oddness in my life for Kubrick to have done it. But since Kubrick is not alive, there are people who are alive who could do it. I mean, other guys who could do it would be the, the Cone brothers. They're not going to do it. They're too in another world. I think they're, they're uh, in a different universe. But I really do believe Scorsese could do a great job and also have a big hit on his hand. You say, ah, oh, it's never going to happen. What do I know it's going to happen? Who knows? Maybe he'll want to do it. If not, I'm going to do it. I'll be the director, writer, producer, actor, star. Save money that way. So let me uh, take your calls on the Savage Nation. And I want to pick up for a minute now uh, from the article, the profile. Party of One, Michael Savage, unexpurgated by K. Senna in the New Yorker, August 3, 2009. And I'll pick up now. The form of Savage's show, the quick cuts from one topic to another, the way familiar political observations give rise to baffling digressions, the fluctuating tension between his blue state life and red state message is at least as important as its content, which means that it's hard to understand him and his appeal at second hand. Did you hear that? It's hard to understand him and his appeal at second hand. You get it? In other words, unless you listen to me, you can't understand why I'm so good. And I'll go back. The immoderate quotes meticulously cataloged by the liberal media watchdog sites are accurate but misleading insofar as they reduce a willfully erratic broadcast to a series of political brickbats. Did you hear that? Did you hear that, all you haters, all you distorted Stalinists? You should be ashamed of yourself because you've just been exposed for the schmucks that you are. He goes on, he says, You could say something similar about the four books that Savage has placed on the Times bestseller list, including The Savage Nation, which reached number one. All our political polemics and none capture the freewheeling sensibility of the show or the complicated personality of the man. He's right about that. 
Last year, while talk radio, and for that matter, talk TV, was obsessed with campaign minutiae, Savage couldn't quite decide how much he cared. Despite his fears about Obama, he was lukewarm in his support of Senator John McCain and frustrated by McCain's faltering campaign. Savage calls him John McShane and often suggests conspiratorially that he didn't really want to beat Obama. Quote, McCain may as well be a fall guy for the New World Order, he said. He told listeners, well, I read that already. Then he goes on to psychological nudity. Savage was born in 1942. And like many successful men who started off poor, he loves to talk about the bad old days. His father ran an antique shop on Ludlow Street on Manhattan's Lower East Side, and he put his son to work in the basement cleaning bronze stack. Do I have any callers from New York? What are they, listening to a ball game? Not one caller from New York, from OR, with all of this? Where are they today? His father ran an antique shop on Ludlow Street on Manhattan's Lower East Side and put his son to work in the basement cleaning bronze statues with a toothbrush dipped in a cyanide solution.